Hello everyone, it's me, the man, the myth, the kinotherapist, and <laughs> and welcome to kinotherapy, everybody. Um, I'm uh, a long time ago. I did a starter pack on South Korean movies, and I thought I would bring this back. This is going to be a little easier than my uh, regular kinotherapy movies, where I go through directors. It's going to be very simple. I just talk to the camera. Uh, sort of uh, springboarding off of my Charlie Chaplin video I just made. Um, now, I'm coming at you with some classic comedy. So, um, yeah, classic comedy today. That's the uh, starter pack I'm doing. Uh, this is an era of films that is very near and dear to me. I remember as a kid, uh, I watched these a lot with my grandpa, and we both just laughed away at these. My grandpa really introduced me to these films, and these are some of the first classic movies that I was actually introduced to. Some of the first, like, style of filmmaking uh, that, that, I ever, that I ever got introduced to. And so, in a way, a lot of these were kind of the gateway for my love of film. Uh, some of these legends, to this day, are still some of my cinematic heroes. And while a lot of film buffs still know who these people are, uh, I feel like they're sadly kind of forgotten about and not talked about as much. Uh, comedy has evolved as it does, uh, maybe for better, maybe for worse. Uh, but much like the point of this channel, I want to remind people of screen legends. I want to remind people that cinema is an art. I want to remind people of classic, foreign, obscure films and just remind them of the artistry that all these different, all these different styles that people have yet to explore contain and the artistic value that they hold. Um, also, I want to qu quickly clarify that uh, this era of classic comedy, um, it, it's, a, it's a specific era, because some of you might be watching this and being like, oh, well, where's Mel Brooks? Where's, where's Monty Python? Uh, where's Woody Allen? And while those are classic to today's standards, um, this is more of a specific era, mainly uh, 1910s to roughly early 1960s, um, although a lot of them are even before then. So, um. Yeah, th these are much earlier than e even even like 70s or even what we would consider classic nowadays. These are the foundations of comedic filmmaking. So, um, yeah, without wasting any more time, let's uh, let's begin. Let's jump right in. Yeah, kicking us off... I oh, yes, I'm wearing these glasses the whole time. So, uh, kicking us off is uh, Charlie Chaplin. Uh, everyone should know who this is. Um, I just did a whole video on him. Uh, I won't harp on him for too long. But um, yeah, essential for basically everyone, very influential to so many filmmakers, not just comedic directors. Um, he is highly respectable, so many people love him. His films are funny, sad, sweet, satirical, poignant, they contain a, a huge range of emotions. And uh, he's just an excellent performer, you know? Uh, you can always tell what he's thinking by his facial expressions, his, bo his body language. Uh, very emotional, but most importantly, as this video pertains, always hilarious. Uh, one thing I didn't really mention, um, well, I kind of did. I, I talked about how influential Chaplin was, but um, that extended a lot farther than we realized. It, it, he was very influential to cartoons as well. Like, um, Chaplin, like, whenever he would run, he would kind of, like, hop around the corner. He'd do that, like, hop on one foot thing. And uh, he would do that, and a, a lot of cartoons started doing that. And I'm pretty sure Chaplin did that before a lot of these animation studios were doing it. He, he influenced Felix the Cat and, and Mickey Mouse and all these different characters and styles. So uh, yeah, hugely influential, incredibly hilarious. Uh, y you'll get a kick out of him. Uh, I recommend The Immigrant, A Dog's Life, Shoulder Arms, Easy Street, The Gold Rush, Modern Times, and City Lights. All right. Uh, next up, uh, the next comedic giant of silent films, Buster Keaton. I love, love, love Buster Keaton. I, I admire Chaplin more as an artist, but Buster, in my opinion, was a better director and maybe even better with comedy. I, I know that's subject, subjective. I might not say he's better at comedy, but um, his, his style was a little more, his technique was a little more distinguishable. It, it was the way he... He did visual comedy, but it was the way he did visual and physical comedy. It, it was a very unique style. He, uh, he he would just play with objects and sets, and uh, he probably just did this off screen, and then he said, what can I do with this in the film? He just took the best ideas and just ran with it. And so many of his films are him just playing on these sets like it's a grand playground. 
he would use ever, every opportunity he could to upend the audience's expectations. <clears throat> uh, but it's not just this. It's not just his physical comedy. It was the way he would photograph and frame these gags. Uh, he was one of the first directors to use the camera to tell a joke. Um, some, somehow like blocking for a comedic effect or uh, framing something in particular. And then something happens and it's just it just reveals the punchline. His most famous film, The General, is just this over-hour-long train chase. The whole movie is a train chase, and it's hilarious. It's one of the funniest and greatest movies of all time. It, it's simple, but it's brilliant. Uh, he was known as the Great Stone Face. Um, he, he kept this constant, blank, neutral expression on his face, which was uh, very different from the usual like shrieking and wide-eyed expressions most comedians would give. <clears throat> Um, nonetheless, he was still a great performer and an incredible stuntman. Uh, one of the craziest stunts he ever did, this is, it's criminal if I don't mention this, everyone mentions this when talking about Buster Keaton, but uh, his most famous stunt was um, standing in front of a, the frame of a house, and it fell over him, and, but the window went right over him where he was standing. <laughs> and, um, and, God, it was such a dangerous stunt that that house weighed like a ton, and if he was off by a couple inches, he would have been seriously injured. So, yeah, a lot of respect for him. He he went all out to get a laugh. Uh, so many people were influenced by him. The likes of Rowan Atkinson, Edgar Wright. Uh, the biggest influence is actually none other than Jackie Chan. Yeah. Buster is a beloved but comedian by so many. Uh, he has one of my favorite quotes of all time, which is, A comedian does funny things. A good comedian does things funny. And I see that philosophy expressed so much in Buster's films. Um, I try to do that in my own comedy, and uh, it's it's just such a helpful, wise quote, and I, I love it so much. So, yeah, please check out Buster Keaton. He's one of the funniest people of all time. You won't regret it. You won't regret it. I recommend The General, Sherlock Jr., Steamboat Bill Jr., Cops, One Week, Neighbors, and The Playhouse. All right, next up, rounding out the uh, Triforce of Silent Comedians, as was seen at the time, is comedian Harold Lloyd. Uh, Lloyd has kind of fallen out of discussion a little as time progressed. Um, I think that's mainly because he didn't direct a lot of his films. He co-directed approximately four of his movies, while Charlie Chaplin and Buster Keaton had a lot more creative control over their work. And um, I, I think that's why people appreciate them more. But uh, don't let that discourage you, because Harold Lloyd is a very talented and very funny comedian. Uh, Lloyd is brought to us by Hal Roach, a filmmaking giant in the classic comedy range. Uh, his studio brought us Laurel and Hardy, Our Gang, Charlie Chase, uh, this weird animal series, which not many footage of it exists. But his biggest star was Harold Lloyd. Uh, Harold Lloyd's persona, uh, as you can probably tell by his simple costume, uh, he, he's meant to be an everyday man. Uh, he's got the spectacles and the hat. He's, uh, he, he's a little, he, he's kind of meek, kind of nibbish, but, but an everyday man. Uh, he, he's prone to greed and zealousy, but, uh, but he's always very likable. Um, a lot of the shorts, they'll start out with uh, just this, this simple idea of uh, him trying to do something, and then the writing, it just, goes, it just goes completely crazier and crazier, and the situation just gets worse and worse for this poor man. But, um, yeah, uh, much like Keaton, he was also a really good stuntman. Um, much like the Falling House bit, um, I, this is obligatory to mention, um, his most famous shot, his most famous moment from any of his films is uh, a scene where he's climbing a building and, uh, the audience is shrieking and laughing at the same time. He, he's hanging onto this clock and the clock starts to fall off and it, it really showed audiences that... Uh, they didn't, cinema didn't have to just be one thing. It could convey more than two emotions at once. <clears throat> um, unlike Keaton, however, one stunt resulted in an injury. Uh, yeah, he was, uh, he was playing around with a fake bomb, which turned out to be a real bomb, and it blew a couple of his fingers off. Yeah, uh, luckily this didn't hinder his career much, and, um, uh, it wasn't very noticeable. He wore, like, prosthetics for the rest of his life, and uh, it wasn't too noticeable in his films either. So, uh, yeah, Harold Lloyd, legendary comedian. Do not skip out on him. His films are hilarious. I recommend Safety Last, The Freshman, and Why Worry. 
All right, now we got Mabel Norman. So um, I almost didn't include Norman, um, although I wanted to bring attention to her eventually, maybe in a future video. Um, but, you know, uh, I thought about including her in here because it's my video. Screw it, I do what I want. It's my channel. <laughs> and, uh, besides, there's too many men in this list. Um, so yeah, Mabel Norman. Um, I'm introducing you to not only the screen's first funny woman, but possibly cinema's first woman to be employed as a director for a major studio. Yeah, that's right. Mabel Norman uh, was a pioneer. She starred and directed her own comedy shorts. See, uh, and she's also thought to be the first comedian to take a pie to the face. Uh, Norma's screen persona is, uh, she's very likable. Uh, she's not overtly goofy like Chaplin, but, uh, she's very earthly and likable. She knows how to be a relatable person caught in a, an awkward situation, like in Mabel's strange predic predicament. But, um, she also knows, uh, when to sort of play it up for a comedic effect. Kind yet sometimes spunky, uh, she gave female audiences, uh, someone to really look up to, uh, during this time in comedy. Um, sadly, like a lot of silent film stars, Norman faded into obscurity due to her personal conflicts and her untimely death. Uh, she's remembered mostly for being a lady, leading lady to Charlie Chaplin sometimes. Of course, that's all she's remembered as. But uh, don't let Mabel Norman disappear. Uh, definitely check her out. Uh, give, give her films a watch. I recommend Mabel's Strange Predicament, Mabel at the Wheel, Tilly's Punctured Romance, Mabel's Blunder, Fatty and Mabel Adrift, The Raggedy Rose, and The Nickel Hopper. All right, our next legendary classic comedian, none other than W.C. Fields. Uh, W.C. Fields began as a vaudeville performer and is a very skilled juggler. Uh, he began acting in his later films and is most fondly remembered for his later work. Um, as his career progressed, he wanted to take more control over his films. He never directed, but he, he often wrote his films and then starred in them, uh, playing a certain character. Uh, he is perhaps the first cynical comic to ever... Uh, meet audiences. Uh, his persona was this bumbling, drunk narcissist. He, uh, he hated dogs and kids, and uh, he just wanted to drown his contempt in alcohol. Uh, this is an extent of Field's real-life personality, and uh, it's neat to see him express himself. Uh, his films often contain satire on stuffy, eloquent suburban folks and lifestyle. Uh, despite it being a little pessimistic, Fields is never too mean-spirited. Um, there's always something likable about him, or something his films uh, are satirizing. Uh, sometimes his films are surreal, like The Million Dollar Legs. Um, all his films have characters with weird-sounding names. That's always fun to watch. Um, another thing that was uh, that uh, something unique he brought to his acting skill was he would kind of like slur his words. You kind of ramble like, rah, 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 and he would like he would talk over other actors as they were talking, which uh, was very uncommon at the time. Typically, you had to wait for the other actor to finish and then deliver the joke but um yeah this it, it really it's really funny like even if he's not really saying much it's just funny and uh it, it was it was really it really adds to his character and uh the, the audience can still attach themselves to him despite his uh his cynicism and his distance from normies at the time uh people really loved watching him he he wasn't that bad but he acknowledged you know kind of just this attitude a lot of people had during that time of just being cynical and pessimistic. So, um, yeah, definitely check out W.C. Fields. I recommend The Bank Dick, Never Give a Sucker an Even Break, It's a Gift, Never Cheat an Honest Man, and My Little Chickadee. Uh, this video is sponsored by water. <clears throat> uh, if you don't drink it, you'll die. All right, next in classic comedy, we got Amos and Andy. Yeah. Nah, no, I'm not. I'm, I'm not gonna touch that. Not nah, going near that. <clears throat> All right, the real next up is our gang. Uh, I thought I'd make a quick mention about uh, one of my childhood favorites, um, the Our Gang shorts, also known as the Little Rascals. Hmm. Yeah, some of you '90s kids, you're starting to remember something, right? Well, uh, yeah, and yes, uh, the 90s film you love is based on these characters from the, the 20s through the 40s. Uh, these shorts were once again produced by Hal Roach Studios. Uh, they featured a slew of characters uh, all throughout its runtime. Uh, the ones that many people remember are, of course, Spanky, Alfalfa, Buckwheat, Porky, Stymie, one of my favorites. <clears throat> 
And uh, it's always entertaining to see these kids do the darndest things. Uh, just to adults and just cause mischief. And uh, I know I'm saying that sarcastically, but like it never it never feels like they're trying to like cash in on the, the cuteness of the kids, you know? Like there's there's good writing, there's funny jokes, there's it, it they're smart, you know? Uh, one thing I noticed while revisiting these shorts is uh it's a really good look at the depression era. Uh, a lot of these kids, uh they were poor, they didn't have such good home lives. Uh, a lot of the episodes featured them trying to raise money for something, either to save their dog or just for anything in general. <clears throat> and uh, that never hit me quite as much as a kid, uh, but it really does now. Uh, additionally, it was one of the first things to portray white kids and black kids playing together on screen. Uh, especially during a time when segregation was strictly enforced. That was very ahead of its time, more so than um, other things. <clears throat> Uh, I love watching these kids build crazy contraptions. I, I love seeing the kids act like kids and do crazy things, sometimes adult things. Uh, I recommend Teacher's Pet, Dogs is Dogs, Honky Donkey, Russian Ballet, Male and Female, The Pooch, High Neighbor, and Hook and Ladder. <clears throat> Find a collection if you can. They're, they're all over the place. Our next uh, group of comedians would be the Three Stooges, a group that everyone has heard of, probably. One of the most lasting comedians to survive. Everyone's aware of their their looks and uh, the goofy antics, you know, the, the constant... Or whatever. Um, I'm not a big Three Stooges fan. Uh, I'll admit that right off the bat. Um, I think they're funny. Uh, they're just not quite as clever as uh, someone like Charlie Chaplin or Buster Keaton. Uh... Their, their chemistry isn't quite as as strong as someone like Laurel and Hardy or Abbott and Costello, which I'll get to in a bit. Um, <clears throat> they're, they're very much like cartoons in real life, you know, with the slapstick and sometimes surreal, painful jokes. Um, they, they do each have their own identity. Mo is the, the mean, greedy one. You got Larry and Curly, who are kind of the dumb ones, I guess. Uh, sometimes Shemp, who is a, a little more witty. Uh, the Three Stooges, much like our gang, was also a good look at the Depression era. Um, these were three urban street urchins just trying to make money. They were just they were in these dead end jobs, just trying to make a quick buck. But you also understood why, because they were in this this dire situation. Uh, they featured a lot of slang and uh, a lot of Yiddish phrases um, due to their Jewish heritage, and um, occasionally they had satire. Uh, one of their most famous shorts is um, actually satirized Hitler approximately nine months before Charlie Chaplin's The Great Dictator was released. So I was wrong when I said Charlie Chaplin was the first one to do it. I'm wrong. I'm dumb. I know nothing about movies. Uwe Boll is better than Stanley Kubrick. So uh, I like them. I respect the, Th the Stooges for a lot of things. Uh, again, very famous. A lot of people love them. Um, I'm just not as ecstatic about them as others on this list especially. Also, uh, I've seen a couple of their feature-length films, and um, Three Stooges in long format, let's just say, uh, nah, nah, no. Um, I recommend You Nasty Spy, Disorder in the Court, Sing a Song of Six Pants, Punch Drunks, and Men in Black. Alright, next comedian, we have Abbott and Costello, the quintessential comedy duo, in my opinion. Uh, the basic format of a straight man, Bud Abbott, who's the greedy, hot-tempered one, setting up punchlines, and the funny one, Lou Costello, who would, uh, deliver the punchlines and was very, uh, clumsy and dim-witted. Dim-wit- dim-witted. Uh, I'm sure you're all aware of their most famous routine, Who's On First, which is, uh, that's been changed and evolved, alternated to fit so many other formats, not just baseball, baseball, and, uh, it's one of the most famous comedy routines in all of history. And uh, that's the thing that they're most known for. And uh, that's really the style that they're known for. Uh, their core comedy was, uh, it came from, it was smart. They had wordplay. They had brilliant back and forth, these brilliant routines. Uh, one of their routines included one with math, which is just so clever and so hysterical. Uh, soon their films started being adventure comedies. Uh, the first one, the very first Abbott and Costello film I ever watched was Abbott and Costello Meet Frankenstein. And this was a perfect mix of my love for comedy and my love for monster movies at the time. 
it actually works as a really good monster movie too. I was uh, I was introduced to them as a child. I think they were the first classic comedians I I ever watched. Uh, so this is a very special duo to me. They have they have a, a special place in my heart. Uh, they had immense popularity, but unfortunately, that kind of brought their downfall. Yeah, Abbott and Costello were producing roughly three to four movies a year, and uh, audiences got kind of tired of it. Uh, they stopped being about the routines and was more about the the little gimmick or character they would meet in the film. Like, I'm not kidding. It was Abbott and Costello meet Boris Karloff. Abbott and Costello meet uh, Captain Kidd. Abbott and Costello meet Osama Bin Laden. It was, it was just endless, and people got tired of it really quickly. They started to suffer fatigue, and but despite how their career ended up, Abbott and Costello are seen as some of the most famous comedians in history. They are one of the most celebrated comedy acts of all time, and I still love them. My love has not waned for them. Uh, I recommend Buck Privates, The Naughty 90s, Abbott and Costello Meet Frankenstein, Hold That Ghost, Africa Screens, Who Done It, and Time of Their Lives. Alright, next comedic duo, Laurel and Hardy. Uh, it's still debated today who was the better comedy duo, Abbott and Costello or Laurel and Hardy. Uh, it's still this big debate. Abbott and Costello fit the mold for what comedy duos were. You got one being funny, but one being the straight man. However, a lot of the, the problem people see with that is there's a straight man who's not really funny. While when you get to Laurel and Hardy, uh, both of them work funny. Don't get me wrong, they still have their own characters. Uh, you could say Oliver Hardy was the straight man, having a more uh, clear mind, uh, but he was also very egotistical and hot-tempered. Uh, Stan Laurel, on the other hand, uh, was probably more of the funny guy, and uh, that sort of fits the formula. So this was their sort of unique take on the comedy duo formula. However, what they did was they were both victims of their own calamity. Uh, Oliver Hardy would get them into a mess for just wanting money, uh, or Stan Laurel would do something clumsy and trip up Oliver Hardy and he'd fall down. Laurel and Hardy are some of the few actors to successfully transition from silent films to sound and kind of survive a studio change, although that didn't last too long. They came from Hal Roach Studios, so a lot of their shorts were situation-based. They had really good writing, uh, really good uh, interactions and conflicts going on. Uh, they're known for milking the joke, which is taking this simple idea, this minuscule idea, and just spreading it thin, just stretching it out, and uh, just stretching it out as far as possibly can. And surprisingly, it worked really well in their favor. It could get tedious, but like, they're such good performers that they're really able to sell it to the crowd. Stan Laurel especially has a very uh, Chaplin-like uh, charm to him. He he has that sort of performance where something will happen and he'll kind of make a face and scratch his head. He doesn't talk much either. Uh, Oliver Hardy is still great. He, he's very good at seeming polite, but then he suddenly snaps at the, the clumsy Stan Laurel who trips him up. Um, which is funny too because uh, Stan Laurel kind of looks like Charlie Chaplin without the mustache. And uh, Oliver Hardy kind of looks like Charlie Chaplin if uh, he put on a few extra pounds. <laughs> but what makes them so legendary is their partnership, the, their camaraderie. The, they work off each other and build from each other so well. It, it's just magic right there on the screen. Uh, Lou Costello himself actually called Laurel and Hardy the greatest comedy duo of all time. But it um, doesn't matter. I'm not trying to close the argument with that. I'm just saying, uh, personally, I don't really know which one I like more. And uh, a lot of people are unsure. But uh, don't let that bother your uh, your enjoyment of these people. Uh, watch Abbott and Costello. Watch Laurel and Hardy. Enjoy them. They are great. They are geniuses. They are some of the funniest comedians to grace the screen. I recommend The Music Box, Way Out West, Sons of the Desert, Big Business, County Hospital, and Twice Two. And closing off the list on a high note are the Marx Brothers. Perhaps the greatest comedy group of all time. These guys are such an inspiration to me in my comedy, especially Groucho, I really take after. <laughs> Each brother is so characterized. They have their, their own comedy style and shtick. They, they encapsulate all the best parts of classic comedy. A slapstick, visual humor, wordplay, insult, surreal humor, sometimes satire even. Uh, you will never find a more unique group of total whack jobs than the Marx Brothers. Uh, you got Groucho Marx, the king of insults. His rapid-fire delivery is just astounding. It makes you jealous to watch on screen and just wish you had that, that wit that he had. 
to compare it to something modern, it's uh, it's almost like Archer, where you go back and watch these episodes or, or these films, and y there's so many lines that you missed because there's just so much being thrown at you, and uh, it's something new every time you watch it. He's a very influential comedian and even inspired some snazzy glasses. Uh, then there's the fan favorite, Harpo Marx, who I have to admit is, is the funniest. Uh, he's sometimes creepy, but somehow a delightful little weirdo. He's completely silent. He wears this trench coat, which he pulls all these props and sight gags out of. Uh, he, he persists in this buffoonish, irrational behavior. He, he's like a clown, but his antics are just so infectious. He, he really has the ability to revert you back into a child and just laugh at just what a weirdo this guy is. Uh, he's often paired up with Chick his Chico Marx, his brother. Yes, it's pronounced Chico. He often speaks in this faux Italian accent and deals mostly with wordplay, um, kind of working off Harpo's uh, visual gags. Uh, while Groucho dealt made with insults uh, and tried to blend in with the, the higher-up crowd, Chico was a bit more of a scoundrel, uh, usually trying to get something, usually working off of like uh, other people. Then we got Zeppo, who was... Uh, the straight man of the group, uh, sometimes called the unfunny Marx brother, which was um, sad, but also true. Um, it, like I said, he was supposed to be the straight man. Um, th they usually gave him a romance, probably someone so the audience could attach themselves to. That way, the whole family didn't come off as being completely insane. Uh, he didn't. He did, He wasn't in all their films. He was only in their first five, I believe. But, uh, yeah, these screwy comedies are, they're very much like a Looney Tunes short. The, the characters are very much like Bugs Bunny or Daffy Duck. Just these complete weirdos, these complete screwballs who are just messing with people just to annoy them. And, uh, they feud with them, they trick them, they insult them. Um, it might seem annoying to some, but, but they're smart about it. Uh, sometimes they included satire on governments or usually, usually just high society and society norms in general. And, uh, you know, I, I think that's challenging. Being weird is challenging, and it's funny, too. Absolutely adore the Marx Brothers. Uh, they will always have a place in my heart. I recommend Duck Soup, Monkey Business, Animal Crackers, A Day at the Races, my favorite, A Night at the Opera, and Room Service. They're just so nuts, so insane that you just gotta love it. You can't, you can't turn it off. I, I wouldn't say they're dated, but they're very much of their time, which might turn some people away. Um, in fact, a lot of these comedians are probably the first thing you think of when you think 1930s comedian. You know, they're kind of corny. Uh, they might not be everybody's cup of tea, but, you know, comedy has evolved. And I think if you really love comedy and even movies, uh, I think you can go back to these and at least appreciate them for their art. You know, um, personally, I think they're very clever. I think they put a lot more effort into comedies than a lot of comedies nowadays. Yeah, sorry to do the whole, oh, the good old days thing. Uh, there's a lot of great comedies now, but I'm much more drawn to this kind of smart, witty style of humor. I'd much rather watch Charlie Chaplin or the Marx Brothers over Tyler Perry or a Seth Rogen vehicle, where the joke is that they're rated R. I'm not offended by it. I'm bored by it. Do something clever. When I when I watch these movies, I'm laughing so often. There's a joke like every five seconds, and I'm just laughing throughout the whole thing. Comedies nowadays, I I'm watching it, and I laugh like maybe every 30 minutes. It needs to be smart. It needs to be well-written. It needs to be well-performed. Uh, try, try experimenting, you know? Don't do what other people want you to do. Do what you want to do. Not saying that there aren't modern comedians that don't do this, but the classic comedians, they put so much effort into these films. They, they really did. They really tried to get you to laugh just so often, so much. But uh, yeah, for a lot of people, I think this comedy will be new to them. So it won't be old or dated. Uh, so yeah, give it a chance. Expand your horizons. Uh, explore uncharted territories, and you may just like it. That's the joy of film watching. Watching movies that you haven't heard of from places that... Uh, you've never gone exploring things that you've never even thought of, things you never even knew to be true or possible. Well, that's going to do it for me today. Uh, I know there's a lot of comedians I missed. Uh, I glossed over Fatty Arbuckle, the, uh, the uh, Dr. Dre of silent comedy. Uh, I know there's, there's Bob Hope, Lucille Ball, uh, Mae West to some extent. Uh, there's a lot of people I wanted to cover, but I didn't want this to be too long. It's just a starter pack. So yeah, uh, be sure to like, share, subscribe, thumb the bell. 
uh, get notifications whenever I make a video. Uh, look forward to more videos on uh, directors and film movements. Be sure to follow me on Letterboxd for individual reviews. Leave a comment. Let me know who your favorite silent comedian is. Let me know who I missed, uh, who I didn't do justice, who I uh, completely forgot about, who I was wrong about. I look forward to making more videos with you guys and joining you on your cinematic journey. Take care.